Do you know the importance of life skills when you're talking about teaching a child with autism or a toddler showing signs? It is, there are so many critical life skills, uh, many of them that I did not even consider life skills until this interview today with Julie Swanson, who is from the lifeskillslady.com website, and she is a special education advocate, and she's also a parent of a adult son with autism. Um, so she goes over the 10 most important life skills that every child needs. So let's get to this really great interview with Julie Swanson. Okay, Julie, it is so nice to meet you and have you here today. Thank you for joining us. Likewise, thank you. Yeah, so we've been following each other on social media for the past year or so, and you are all about life skills. But before we get into your area of expertise and the content that I'm sure our listeners are going to love, let me hear very briefly in a minute or two, your fall into the autism world. Yes. So thank you. Um, So my son, Alex, who is 29 years old, um, was diagnosed when he was three around 1997. And if, you know, for those of you who are um, a a lot younger than I am, (laughs) um, autism was a low incidence disorder. Like I had to look it up in a set of 1950s encyclopedias and that was not pretty. Um, And so I was in a position where I had to advocate for him. And at that time, you know, uh, I was advocating for applied behavior analytic services to use those principles. And not only did our school not know what that was, and we didn't have one BCBA, board certified behavior analyst in the entire state of Connecticut, which is where I'm from. um, I ended up in a disagreement with my school district and had to go to a hearing and worked with uh, an attorney. And that experience was a boot camp in understanding the law. And we prevailed in our case and word got around. I'm a, I'm a really small state here and autism kept rising, ticking up, 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 up. And, oh, you know that Julie Swanson, she got her son this, this, that, and the other, you got to call her. Um, and before I knew it, so many people were calling me and I was ready to go back to work. I was a television producer in a previous lifetime. And I said to myself, I think I have a new career. I think I need to help parents do this. And I've been doing it for 23 years now, later. Um, and so I got into it. I got became a special education advocate because of, through advocating for my own son. And my passion for life skills has come out of my experience of dealing with so many families who have kids with autism. And as our kids are aging out now and becoming adults, seeing the barriers they have to successful adulthood. And there's a direct link between life skills and the likelihood of increasing quality of life and increasing independence through life skills. So that's my short, hopefully I did that in less than a minute and a half. And you told me not to use my hands because we got something going on with that, but I, 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 I'll have to sit on them or something. <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden zoom did a new update and now it's doing fireworks yeah. and thumbs up yeah. when we talk with our hands. Um, yeah. I have very similar background to me. And the reason there were just fun fact, the reason there were no BCBAs in the state of Connecticut in 1997 is because there was there were no BCBAs back um, ever. You know, it didn't it didn't come to be a national certification until around 2000, right. Right. and I was certified in 2003 as a BCBA, um, and then later got my uh, PhD in leadership and became a doctoral level BCBA. But um, same thing happened to me. Right. I ended up asking for ABA and got into. Uh, mediation and then a due process case and yes, became so much a fun, very big uh, learning ground yes. for for learning about special education right. law right. and your rights. And I founded the Autism Society in my county and helps people advocate yep. too. Um, Don't underestimate so, a mother. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I, so, we had to hire the very first, We I had a home program and I had to bring the BCB up from Rutgers 
-hmm. New Jersey, which yep. they happen to be a hub for, yep. you know, I um, used to be CBA for Rutgers too. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, go ahead with your questions. Yeah. Yeah. So very similar background. So your son is 29 and he is he uh, remains pretty impaired with autism. So my son has high support needs. He has not only autism, but he has an intellectual disability. He's fabulous, by the way. Um, but he is um, highly impacted by his autism. He's nonverbal and or non-speaking i know there are different ways of saying that um today but he has um he's a really great guy who has a lot of skills that are commensurate with who he is mm -hmm. and um he's he's doing very well he has a he has a great adulthood um mm -hmm. based on a lot of stuff that uh, hopefully we're going to talk about today um oh. that have paved the way for him to have um, a meaningful adult life mm -hmm. and to be content. And really at the end of the day, for so many parents who have kids who are, who, whose kids are lower on the spectrum, you'll never hear me say high functioning or low functioning, but are lower on the spectrum with higher support needs. Um, you know, I got to the point where I had to realize, okay, I'm always shooting for the stars with him. But at some point, you have to be realistic about what their their abilities are and commensurate with his abilities. He's doing very well. Yeah. And I am big on self-care and life skills as well. I, I wasn't always. And we're going to talk about specifically, you know, how everybody listening, even if you have a two year old, you need to be listening for for these skills as well. But my big thing is every child, whether they have autism or not, we're we're shooting for as safe as possible, as independent as possible, and as happy as possible. And so if everything goes through those lenses, you know, so life skills are, are a huge part of it. So before we get into like the 10 critical life skills, maybe just get us on the same page. What is a life skill? Well, the IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, never talks about life skills. They talk about functional skills and they don't always, they actually don't define functional skills because there's an assumption that people know they are the skills they need to function. Life skills are generally known as those skills, the skills that we need to have to meet the demands of everyday life, it, you know, and that's a lot, right? That includes our emotional regulation, our problem solving, our ability to um, self-advocate. And a lot of our kids can't do that. And I understand that. But uh, being a flexible guy, like just being flexible. We know this is these are so difficult for so many of our kids. And um, so many folks don't often think of life skills in the 10 areas that they actually are. We think of life skills as, you know, hygiene and can you make a sandwich in the kitchen? You know, kitchens, you know, being being able to work around the kitchen. And it's so much more than that. I did want to just um, read something really quickly. Um, and, and, and this is, we don't have a lot of research or studies on adult outcomes. But this, and we need to do a better job and everybody recognizes that, but this is just a little blip I'm going to read to you from the National Autism Indicators Report, which is Transition into Young Adulthood. And for all of you moms and dads and, and parents out there and grandparents, I know I'm talking about adulthood, but you have to start the process to be ready for that now, believe it or not, in preschool. And um, just reading a real quick little blip here for you. Um, and that is that young adults with autism have a difficult time following high school for almost any outcome we, you choose, including working, continuing school, living independently, socializing, participating in the community, and staying healthy and safe. We have to do better. And so my mission at the lifeskillslady.com is to increase life skills one student at a time, increase quality of life and increase the likelihood that you're going to increase independence, one student, one life skill at a time. Okay, that sounds right. good. So what are our 10 right. life skills? 
Okay. So if you go to my website, which is lifeskillslady.com, I have this free printout. Okay. And I call it the life skills cheat sheet for IEP planning so that you can have it right at your ready when you are in a special education meeting for your child. And there are three domains, three categories of life skills. One is conceptual skills. The other one is social skills. And the other one is practical life skills. And in the conceptual skills is one of the hardest areas for many of our kids with autism because it includes having to apply insight into um, into situations. So, okay, so the conceptual skills include communication, which is understanding and using verbal and nonverbal language, functional academics, which is using reading, writing, and math in everyday life, self-direction, this is a really big one, um, self-direction, problem solving. How many times do you see problem solving in an IEP? Oh, oh, I got the, it's okay. Never, never, you never see it. Exercising choice, initiating and planning activities, the skills needed for independence, responsibility, and self-control, emotional regulation, right? Including starting and completing tasks, keeping a schedule, following time limits, following directions, and making choices. So those are the three areas under conceptual skills. Um, under social- And, there, and yes. I just want to add that if you're sitting here thinking, well, my son, you know, doesn't speak, doesn't right. really understand, has a hard time even with choices with no visuals in place, you know, these are can't read, can't write, you know, that's, that's fine. That's where they're at. But that doesn't mean that, I mean, it's interesting because when I think of life skills, I probably think of category number three of the practical life skills. So does everyone. <laughs> these, these conceptual skills, even just assessing and putting in programming for them to make better choices, for them to follow right. a visual schedule, for them to right. um, problem solve by doing puzzles and things like right. that, that add right. to, to problem solving. Um, we don't want anybody listening to go like, well, that's ridiculous. Well, My son can't. Let, let me give you an example. So if I didn't say this, you know, my son um, it has autism. He also has an intellectual disability and he's non-speaking, right? And how do we apply problem solving to Alex? Well, Alex is not going to be, is, is not capable of saying, so Alex, we have this problem and we need you to solve it. Okay, that's not going to happen. I'd love for it to happen, but it's not going to be happening. And that's where parents at some point have to be realistic and meet your child where they're at, right? But what we did teach Alex to do is we realized he was too prompt dependent, okay? Even going to an ABA school, and they were fabulous about that, right? But we could still decrease prompt dependency. So we started to give Alex wait time. We would wait him out so that he could solve the problem. An example would be, let's say, putting away... The, no, the knives and the forks and the spoons in the drawer. And Alex might take some time and not really know the answer of what he should do, but we gave him time. We let him, and then we prompt him to sort of, you know, scan over things. Then he'd figure it out on his own. If he didn't get it within like 15 seconds, we redirected him back and say, here's how you do it, buddy. These are all using the principles of ABA, but also relatedness, right? Mm -hmm. And he learned over time that we're going to give him time and not always give him the answer. So he had to start scanning and figure it out on his own. And lo and behold, what did we learn? He can problem solve, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so yeah. it doesn't have to be some highfalutin problem that is, you know, um, somebody's late. What do you do? Right? right. It can be as simple as the daily things we do in everyday life. Yeah. Yeah. So. And even for a child with a little bit more language, say they're, they're coming along, they're still not conversational. You can use indirect prompts. So right. tell me something that's yellow and they, right. they hesitate instead of just saying banana, you can give right. an indirect prompt, like something that's yellow that monkeys eat. Right. 
And so then he comes up with banana. Okay, let's, you know, so using indirect prompts, giving more wait time um, and looking for ways to give more choices and to um, have a little more problem solving. And And I think, is that called declarative language? I know it's something language, but anyway, we can get back to that. Not really sure. I know it's called an indirect prompt, but okay. Okay. So that's the first area of life skills. Second one is social skills. And there's two areas under social skills. Um, Social skills, the general big category is just um, the skills we need to get along well with others. Um, Understanding following social rules, customs, obeying laws, detecting the motivations of others to avoid victimization and deception. And we know that many of our kids are at risk for that, right? I, not to go off uh, off tangent, but I spoke in Utah at a... um, a, 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 a whole um, conference um, with BCBAs and there was a whole uh, section of it that was on sexuality and autism. And what are we finding out through research is the best way to help kids not become victims of deception, but start working on choice at a very early age. Do you want this or do you want that? So that the very first time, if and God forbid, you're in a situation where somebody wants to take advantage of you, you've practiced making choices. No, Mm -hmm. I don't want that. Mm -hmm. We don't typically teach our kids that, right? So so anyway, so social skills is maintaining interpersonal relationships, understanding emotions and social cues, understanding fairness and honesty, using manners, obeying rules and laws. Here's the other one. This is one of my favorites. I've got some favorites on this list. And my biggest favorite is self-direction because those are all the critical skills that so many of our kids with autism have barriers and aren't always explicitly taught in the IEP. Next one is leisure skills. I love leisure skills. What, what, what adds to our quality of life but our ability to have a nice, robust set of leisure skills, right? And so leisure skills is taking responsibility for one's own activities and having the ability to communicate in the in the in the community. The last one, Mary, which is the one that a lot of people like you think of when we think of life skills, and they're called practical skills. And those have five areas. First one is self-care, right? Just our ability to bathe and toilet and and groom and and all of that. The next one is home or school living. And this is the skills we need for basic care of our living space, including laundry, housekeeping, food preparation, and all of these skills you can start with their kids, with your kids when they're very, very tiny little eeny weenies, right? Put, you know, you don't have to empty the, 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 what's it called? The dishwasher, but take this spoon and put it away. You know, you can start with things like that and then backward chain it, right? Put away um, toys and clean up a bin of toys and blocks. Absolutely. Community use. And this is um, using shopping, uh, transportation, um, and tapping into our community services. Um, health and safety. This is my three, my big, big three favorites. Health and safety is a big one for me. And that's the ability to protect oneself medication management and responding to health problems. And so many of our kids today, what are we, what are they all addicted to? Right. And I've got kids who I've got IEP goals for them just to use um, technology appropriately because there's a lot of dysregulation around taking those things away. Right. But that, Mm -hmm. that falls under health and safety, right. And being at risk for being online. Um, these are often things that people don't generally think of to include in the IP. And of course, this would also include sexuality, right? Our health and safety. Um, well, and I would I would also say, as especially as a registered nurse and a behavior analyst, is that one of the really most important skills is to teach kids how to tell you they're in pain um, and which body parts in pain. And because- okay. That is, I think, a big a big um, deficit in many kids. I did a video blog on that. We can link it in the show notes. Yeah. I've done a lot of work yeah. on that first area of self-care, you know, toileting, dressing, yeah. grooming, bathing. My digital assessment, which is uh, was 
first created in in the fall of 2022 um is is really good for a third of it is on these basic self-care skills which i would argue out of all those things you listed are where we need to start. I mean, we, we also, we need to be aware of all of those because I think they're all really good, but in a lot of cases, it's the adult who's going to supervise the medical management, supervise keeping the child safe, um, at least until they're able to uh, self-advocate and keep themselves safe and manage their own medicine and let, let me tell you my own health and safety sort of yeah. story. Um, I've always been really big on this and we've done lots of desensitization programming with Alex for years and years since he was a little guy from, you know, hair cutting to nail clipping to medical procedures, which is my big bailiwick, right? And um, so Alex, for the very first time in his life at 29 years old, had a blood draw. So I'm just gonna tell you this story real quickly. I would literally have to four adults to five adults would have to manhandle Alex to give him a shot. Let's start with the shot. And, you know, any parent would knows that I would be reduced to tears. I would shake for 48 hours. It's traumatic for not only the adults, but for the person. And I went online and I have, and I discovered a product that I should be, I, oh, so there's my hands that I should actually be doing commercials for. And it's called the Buzzy. And it was created by um, a doctor and a parent who discovered that through vibration and cold, you completely numb the pain signal to the brain. So Mm -hmm. I bought myself a Buzzy, which by the way, I can link, I give you all that information. I even have like a discount code for it because I'm such a big believer in this product. Okay. And we did a desensitization program with Alex just for him to use the buzzy. And he had his first shot with his very first vaccine that we did not have to physically hold him down with five adults. Mm -hmm. That was life changing. Now, now blood. I'm like, oh, I'm never going to like, this is a, that's a whole other frontier, the blood, right? The only time that Alex ever had in his whole 29 years of life up until recently blood drawn was twice when he had to go in for some medical procedures because Alex can only be, he has to go under anesthesia to get blood. Well, he had to have a dental procedure about a few months ago and they do an EKG before and the EKG was abnormal and the doctor said, Julie, he needs blood before blood work before we can operate on him. I'm like, Oh my God, how am I going to do that? Well, I fashioned a box for him to not be able to see the procedure. And I got out my buzzy. We did some desensitization. I have, I tell the story on my social media. I can link it if you'd like. Um, And for the very first time in his life, Alex got his blood drawn with using this buzzy. So think about the fact that he was not able to get one of the most basic medical procedures until he was 29 years old. And it was this fabulous piece of assistive technology, low tech assistive technology that helped a, like it is a dramatic life changer that my son does not have to go into the hospital and be put under anesthesia to get a blood draw. So that is why I am so passionate about saying to parents, look, please start working on the toleration of these medical procedures early. Unfortunately, we don't have good statistics when it comes to health for our kids when they become adults. They are not accessing healthcare in the same way that the rest of us do. And Mm -hmm. how can we start, you know, knocking down the barriers to that? have them be able to tolerate these basic medical procedures, even down to teeth cleaning. Well, absolutely. And I have done a lot of work with this. I don't know if you know, but my book, Turn Autism Around, chapter 13, is called Desensitize Dr. Dennis and Haircut Visits. And in here, I talk about desensitizing everything, you know, um, eye drops and eyes and other things that you know, you make some really valid points. We need to start this early and it's not just to prepare for adulthood. I mean, 
you know, kids need stitches, kids need, oh, um, Lucas needs allergy shots. And in the beginning, I didn't know how that was going to go, but we were very good with practicing desensitization. I have, um, actually videos of me practicing teeth cleaning with my son. Yeah. Um, we can link that. So it's really important that you start thinking about it because it's, it's, it's also a life skill to have, um, kids and adults tolerate, you know, sitting down, putting your arm out calmly right. and giving, you know, giving a blood sample or getting your teeth cleaned or, um, and there are kids like Lucas, every couple of years, he does go out under anesthesia and gets a full dental cleaning and x-rays and, right. you know, but he can tolerate, you know, a basic checkup as well. So, right. and it's not to say that he's always for the rest of his life. You know what I mean? You start yeah. where your child is at and you use these very proven strategies and proven right. reinforcement. And I love that buzzy thing. I've never heard of it, yeah. but that that's a really good tool that right. can, um, in the beginning we used, um, Emla cream, which was a numbing kind yeah. of thing. So right. like, those things really help. But like, if you're out there and you're cutting your child's nails while they're asleep or, yeah. you know, just buzzing off their hair while you, while somebody half holds them down, like it's, it's never going to get better unless you practice slowly, incrementally right. with right. the right. child awake and cooperating. They're not long-term sustainable solutions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the fact is that I love the fact that you have a chapter. Desensitization is one of my favorite things. Mm -hmm. I, I can't begin to tell you how much success we have had doing mm -hmm. desensitization programs with my son. And I attribute it to so many of his successes. The last one is work. Okay. And now for a lot of kids, I know you're saying, oh my God, my, why do I have to worry about work right now? Well, you don't really, but here's, here's the thing that you do need to know is it's easy to get a job. It's harder to keep a job. Okay. And in order to, at some point, whether you're going to be fully competitively employed or not competitively employed at all. And like my son, he's not employed, but he, he works, works, um, at a horse farm every day, changing the water for the horses with a support person. Um, and, but he still has to have a lot of life skills to do that successfully. Right. So, those are the 10 areas of life skills and it's on my website for free. And um, I also have for everyone, it's free on my website. When you are in a public school, there can be, and I love our public schools and I love our public school teachers. So, but we know that it can sometimes be challenging to advocate for our children, right? Um, I, and I'm an advocate. And I get pushback to incorporating life skills into the IEP early. And you might hear your team say, well, we, it, we don't have to teach that life skill because without it, the child can access the general education curriculum. Now that's, that's, that's language right out of the IDEA, but the statute, which is on the um, definition of an IEP goes on to say um and to meet to meet each of the child's other educational needs that result from the child's disability and it goes on you from a legal perspective you don't have to just prove that your child needs it to access the general education curriculum so what i did is i wrote another cheat sheet it's a discussion guide that when you're in your IEP meeting and you're asking for these things, you can literally say, hey, do you mind if we go over this discussion guide and go through it? And it's all legally right here why the team should support it. Hmm. So it's a good idea. Yeah. Really and and using my free assessment at marybarbera.com forward slash assessment, you can take that, you can turn it into a plan and then you can have more data to show the IEP team. 
that this isn't just like something you read on the internet. Like this is, this is really important. And, and like desensitization to dental visits or to haircuts or to toothbrushing or hand washing, that can all be a part of the IEP. Um, what, what astounds me is a lot of times there's no goals in the IEP for reduction of problem behaviors. And it's oh. like, if you've got <laughs> problem behaviors, you don't just need a behavior plan that's floating in the middle of nowhere. You need actual goals. Linked you need, to it. Yeah. You absolutely. need people, behavior analysts, preferably to be overseeing things, you know, getting a one-to-one is nothing if you don't have goals and management and direction and support. Um, the other thing so that folks can access on my website, on my resources page, is I have, um, if everybody's aware of the, uh, I forget, was it 2017 or whatever the year was, the Andrew F. Um, Supreme Court case. Okay. It was about a um, child who had autism. And this, you know, there hadn't been a Supreme Court case since forever. Um, and the reason that this case went to the Supreme Court is because there was a split among the 12 circuits. What does that mean? There's a, we have 12 circuits in the, in the United States and every single one interpreted what the definition of FAPE was differently, a free appropriate public education. So this case went to the Supreme Court so that we could finally put a, an end to the split in the circuits about interpreting the mm. um, the FAPE. And okay. understood.org did the most fabulous job, it's very hard to find on the web, of synopsizing the, the, the big points that came out of the Andrew F case. And I have it right on my website where you can print out both the Andrew F IEP guide and the talking points. And um, I forgot why I'm talking about that, but for our kids who have autism, for you to be armed with the information you need at the IEP level to say, hey, I this is what this is what this is what came out of this case. No, we ha this is what the law says. Not that I ever get like to get too law-ish when I'm in an IEP meeting, but if you're getting pushback, you may have to refer to it. So that's another resource I have on my resources page. Right. Okay. Well, it sounds like you have a ton on lifeskillslady.com. So um, I think everybody's going to want to check that out. We'll link those resources also in the show notes here. So before we let you go, yes. part of my podcast goals are not to just help the kids, but help the parents and professionals listening to be less stressed and lead happier lives. So what stress reduction tips do you have, self-care tools for yourself do you practice? Well, two things I, 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 I want to say. One of the most underutilized related services under the IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, is what's called parent counseling and training. And that's a related service where the school district um, uh, has an obligation to help you understand your child's special education needs and their special needs and for you to support that IEP. And if you're not only if you're not already asking your school district to say I'd like ongoing parent training on how I can help support my child's IEP, I please fire that up, okay? Because when we know what the school is doing and how we can help support that, we're going to increase our likelihood of generalization of skills, right? And that helps us in how we're functioning as a family unit right? The other thing is, back in my day, um, we didn't have the mandates that now are, well, in most states, um, for around insurance. And I, through my um, hearing, got my son to have 10 hours of home programming a week from the time he was three to 22. And I'm telling you right now that turned his life around, okay? Mm -hmm. But how can you get that today? If you're lucky enough to have your insurance be able to pay for autism services in your home, again, please fire that up because now you can have a home team who's collaborating with your school team and working on all of these generalization skills. 
So many times we are operating in the bubble of what's being taught at school, but we're not getting the family involved to help generalize those skills. And believe it or not, I think while that's not going and having a, a spa treatment or a deep pressure, you know, massage, um, these are things that slowly help support the likelihood of increasing independence and quality of life, which only helps your child, which then it helps you. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. It, yeah. And, and I totally agree with that. I think studies have shown actually that the more parents can learn, yeah. um, the better problem behaviors will get, the, the less stress the family and the child will have. Um, and, and my son, Lucas always had home services, uh, because of the state we lived in and the coverage that was granted. Um, and it, you're right. It was a big part of it. Um, and my knowledge had increased and yeah, it, it all, it all works out and everybody's at a different point, but I think right. advocacy seems like it, it takes a lot of time and is super stressful, but if you can advocate and get services, right. it'll actually make your life a lot easier. Right. And, you know, to that run. point, you know, um, I'm a special education advocate. I advocate all over the country. I'm not espousing for you to hire me. That's not why I'm doing this. But, you know, I had an advocate when I first started because yeah. I didn't know what I didn't know. Yep. And so many people, when I, when I start working with someone, I have two goals to get an appropriate program in place for your child and to help you learn as much as you possibly can for me. So you don't need me, right? Mm -hmm. My hands again. So, you know, even if you have to work with an advocate um, in the beginning, learn as much as you can, learn as much as you can so that you, because how you advocate for your child, there is a direct link between your advocacy efforts and the outcomes of your child for sure. And again, this isn't going to have a spa treatment, but it does potentially do the increasing of functioning for your child, which hopefully re just reduces your stress as well. Yeah. It's, yeah. All, about, it's all about skill acquisition, right? Now, for yourself so that you can, what I say, be the captain of the ship for your child right. so that you and can coordinate right. the care and and make right. sure everybody's on the same page and being positive and, and teaching right. the right way and involving the family. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a complicated journey. I mean, it sounds like it is. we have had very similar paths, yes. um, but you know, wherever you are in the world or however old your child or clients are, or how, what functioning level they're at, there's always improvement that can be made in all the life skills that Julie talked about today. So thank right. you so much for your time. Gosh, I talk so quickly because you told me, you know, we, we got to get get it in a half an hour. So no, I, I think it was great. Felt like I was on, sort of on speed mode, but. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I'm sure my listeners will love it and um, they'll check out your website too. We also have done other podcasts that we might link in the show notes below with um, Kirby and Amanda also do IEP um, yes. coaching and, and you can find a lot of local people too, um, by searching your area, but Julie is certainly a great expert as well. And we can check out her resources as well. So Let me give thanks you so much. If you want to find a local advocate or attorney in your area, go to COPA, which is the Council of Parent Advocates and Attorneys. And they have a whole list of advocates and attorneys in each state. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So anyway, Great thank tip. you so much. All Mary. right. Thank you. you. And I'll see you on TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and everywhere else. So uh, life skills lady all over social media as well. All right. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.